Good afternoon to all of you. To the parents, siblings, and other family members of our incredible Brown community, I want to wish all of you an incredibly warm welcome to Family Weekend. My name is Ricky Jong, and I'm the president of Brown's Undergraduate Council of Students, commonly referred to as UCS. We are the elected student body representatives whose mission is to connect students to advocacy, to administration, as well as to collaborate with diverse interest groups across campus to implement positive changes both in student quality of life as well as in advocacy and equity. This year, we're incredibly excited to be scaling up our efforts in building accessible communities around campus. And after the worst of the pandemic, we are very much starting to see student activities across campus thrive again. We have more student groups on campus now than ever we're very recently, we very recently eliminated the financial barrier to participating in club sports and our arts and performance groups, many of which you'll get to experience this weekend if you haven't already, are flourishing. All of us students are incredibly excited to have you here with us and to be able to spend time with our families again. Someone who has worked with us students leader, student leaders closely in fostering a sense of community and family at Brown for students away from their hometowns is President Paxson, who I have the pleasure of introducing. President Paxson is a noted economist and public health expert. She has served as Brown University's 19th president and a professor of economics and public policy since July 1st, 2012, and just celebrated her 10 year anniversary. She has led Brown in the development of a strategic plan that has positioned the university to elevate academics, develop the physical campus to support a world-class education, and support the students, faculty, and staff who live and work at Brown. Please join me in welcoming President Paxson. Thank you, Ricky. And it's such a pleasure to work with our students who are the UCS representatives. So they, they do a fantastic job. Thank you for everything that you do and your colleagues. So good evening, everybody. Welcome to Family Weekend. Uh, I am just thrilled to have so many of you back on campus for this in-person, vibrant weekend. Best weather ever, don't you think? It's amazing. So in a few minutes, I'm going to have the privilege of introducing Dean of the College, Rashid Zia, who will introduce three of our distinguished faculty members and moderate their conversation. I'm really looking forward to that. We have incredible faculty across all disciplines, and I've asked these three individuals here tonight to join us because they've all experienced Brown from multiple perspectives, first as students, and then as faculty members. And I would add that Dean Zia, you'll see when I introduce him, also falls into that category. So I asked them if they'd each speak for a few minutes about how they view the distinctive Brown educational experience. And they're also delivering faculty forums over the course of the weekend. So if you like what you hear, you can go and hear more of them uh, during the course of the weekend. So before we turn to the faculty, I just want to say a few brief words about this weekend and what it's like to be a student at Brown. Now, first, before we get there, I want to encourage all of you. We, we have an amazing program. The staff here, the faculty, have put together uh, faculty forums. They're walking tours led by the Center for the Study of Slavery and Justice. Uh, you can catch an a cappella concert. You'll have a classic Ivy League football matchup against Cornell. We will win. And I hope that all of us, will, all of you will join us downtown tomorrow night for Water Fire. That starts at 5.45 p.m. at Water Place Park. And if you haven't been there before, it's this beautiful kind of world-class experience, community art experience that is distinctly Providence. It's really amazing. We started by a Brown alum named Barnaby Evans, and Barnaby will be hosting a session tomorrow as well, so you can learn about the magic that he's created here in Providence, and it's been spread around the world, literally, uh, since he started it. The most important thing for the families to do this weekend is for you to see firsthand what life is like for your child at Brown. 
And, you know, the past couple years have taught us that we can do a lot virtually. We know that. But it's also displayed what we value, being together in person, the relationships, the collaborations that develop in a residential university. Now, every college student is different. And how you communicate with the students in your family is going to also be different. It's going to vary. Some of you may be getting real-time, daily downloads of everything that's happened. Others, and this has been my experience as a Brown parent, is that you may be able to coax out only tiny bits of information, mostly by text. And it goes something like this. Question, how are your classes? Answer, a few minutes later, great, exclamation point. That's good. Question, are you getting along with your roommate? Answer, hours later, a thumbs up emoji. <laughs> Question, are you getting enough sleep? No response, <laughs> ever. Nope. So usually the families of first year students, you're the most heavily represented here during family weekend. But some of you have, have come because you haven't had a chance to be here in person during family weekend. Maybe your students are sophomores, juniors, or even graduating this year. So I, I hope that you all have a great time. And I hope you see, recognize three things during the course of family weekend. The first is that your children, your students, feel grounded and comfortable. That they have made or are beginning to make of their first year students, the lifelong friends, they're finding their place within this Brown ecosystem, which is you know, wonderful and complex and rich. This is really important that students find their place here. All students should feel a sense of ownership at Brown, no matter what their path to get here. Brown is their university, no matter what their interests are. They have a stake not only in their own intellectual and social development, but in the success of everyone in this community. This ownership, this sense of you know, commitment to a connected community is really one of the primary things that unleashes the magic of student-centered learning. It's an environment that we work so hard to create and sustain. These are intellectually curious, creative, and very good-hearted students. And they have an uncommon ability to work together in ways that help everyone learn more and aspire higher. I'm constantly astonished by the goodness of this community. And it starts with our students, your children, joining with faculty and administrators to create the caring and collaborative community that we all want. Now second, and I'm going to speed this up a little bit. You can see I'm losing my voice, right? Sorry. Uh, I've been talking a lot today. I hope that you see that your students are enrolled in courses that are interesting, challenging, and provide the intellectual engagement that's really the hallmark of a Brown education. There are lingering myths out there. I heard one from somebody not too long ago. The open curriculum puts students, gets them off the hook from taking hard courses. You're likely hearing something very different. And in fact, something really funny happened during the pandemic. I started hearing from parents whose students were studying at home, had chosen to do that, that their children had far too much work to do because their parents were seeing them doing it. Now, I also heard from parents who were avidly listening in on classes from the room next door, pretending they weren't, uh, to classes that they would have loved to take themselves. And that was quite great. So the point here is that Brown students are serious about their academics, and the open curriculum does lend itself to academic rigor. I'm sure that you'll hear that from the faculty who will speak later. So the last thing I would say is that I hope that your children are developing a cadence of academics, extracurriculars, maybe including athletics, arts, other things, social life, and yes, sleep that works for them. My experience is that striking this balance, especially in the first year, it can be tough. Students at Brown are eager to leap into everything, everything. You know, I talk to students who say, yeah, I'm shopping six classes and I joined five clubs. Like, no, you can't do that. But, but they want to do that, and they're great. 
I, I think that there's a role that families can play during this time, not telling them what to do, because they're adults, but really helping to guide them to make good choices. A little nudging can go a long way in helping them to set realistic goals, priorities, and assuring them that they will have plenty of time here at Brown to do everything that they want to do. So we all know that the last couple years have been challenging. They've tested higher education, uh, issues of national concern, racism, immigration, free speech, political and economic polarization, not to mention a pandemic. These have all been difficult and contentious issues on American college campuses. But, but I do think that it's during these times of tension that we witness the resilience and the goodness of our communities. And I really stand proud of what we're doing at Brown. And I stand proud of what our students are doing at Brown. Every single day, the, student, the story that we're creating here, I think, is the same. And it's students and faculty learning and advancing knowledge in a spirit of free inquiry and joy in a diverse and supportive community. And that's what we aspire to here. So now what I'd like to do is turn the program over to Rashid Zia. I think I have like three more minutes of voice left to me. Rashid is the dean of the college, which means he is oversight of all aspects of the undergraduate academic program. He is also a professor of engineering and physics. There's a lot of ands in Rashid's introduction. So get it, engineering and physics. He continues to teach our students, so he's a dean and a professor. And if that's not enough, he's a brown, proud Brown alumnus. He received his combined BA and Bachelor of Science in English and American Literature and Electrical Engineering from Brown in 2001. And he joined the faculty in 2006 after receiving his master's degree and his PhD from Stanford University. So please join me in welcoming Rashid Zia. Thank you. Thank you, President Paxson, and good evening, everyone. Um, as President Paxson shared, my name is Rashid Zia, and I'm going to share a part of the biography that Chris skipped over, which is that in addition to being a proud undergraduate alum and a faculty member and dean, I'm a former Californian and a proud Providence, Rhode Island resident. Um, as President Paxson shared, I headed west for doctoral studies at an engineering school not to be named in California, and then returned to Brown as soon as possible for what this weekend showcases. Of course, the beautiful autumn weather of Rhode Island, and more importantly, the amazing community of scholars, students, and teachers, all committed to advancing the frontiers of knowledge together to improve our world and the human experience. This evening, it is my pleasure to welcome to the podium three distinguished alumni who, after pursuing studies elsewhere, have also chosen to return to College Hill. These faculty with whom I have the pleasure of working nearly every day are all colleagues whose groundbreaking research, inspiring teaching, and truly visionary leadership define our shared learning community today. First, we have um, my colleague, Tejal Desai, our Sorensen Family Dean of Engineering, Tejal returned to Brown earlier this year from the University of California, San Francisco. She's an accomplished biomedical engineer, a member of the National Academy of Medicine, and a graduate of the Brown class of 1994. Please join me in welcoming Tejal. Thank you, and uh, welcome to all of you. Wow, what a crowd. Uh, I just can't believe how wonderful it is to see everyone here. And many thanks to Dean Zia and uh, President Paxton for such a warm introduction. I am delighted to be joining you here tonight uh, as the Sorensen Family Dean of Engineering and as an alumna of Brown, class of 1994, and also a parent of college-aged children and I know, because of that, that this is an exciting time for your children, our students, 
And as parents and family members, this is a special time for you. Thank you for all that you've done to prepare and support your children, um, your siblings, your grandchildren, um, and really get them to the point where they can take full advantage of their time as undergraduates at Brown. As Dean Zia mentioned, I began as Dean of the School of Engineering actually just a short time ago, uh, about six weeks ago. And um, although it's been a few weeks, in some ways I've prepare, been preparing for this role for many, many years. And, um, you know, in, until uh, I was a, a graduate of Brown. As an alum of Brown, I really feel like I've been welcomed home. It was on this campus that many years ago I was able to explore and grow. And the experience really shaped who I am today, how I think, how I lead, how I interact with my community. I, I grew as a scientist and as a person. And as a student studying biomedical engineering, I saw how critical it was to understand how scientific problems and engineering technologies could actually be used to benefit society and how we could use our technological skills, partnering with those around us to really make an impact. I also realized the importance of critical thinking, thoughtful discourse, collaboration, fostered by a community that values everyone. And so why did I come back to Brown? Well, I was drawn to Brown in part because of this deep connection to the university that began three decades ago. And while this may be the roots of my return, it is the Brown today that actually was most exciting and appealing. I was attracted by President Paxton's vision for this university that con was conveyed so powerfully to me. To fulfill our mission of education, research, public engagement, and doing that at the highest level to impact locally and globally. And as an alum, I know and believe in the distinctiveness of Brown. It's this intrinsic quest of students, faculty, and staff who share their interest in making a societal impact through innovative and collaborative approaches to research, teaching, and engagement. And this is evident in the School of Engineering where I see so many of my colleagues and the students that are there addressing great challenges of today. From energy to environmental sustainability, human health and wellness, and much, much more. We are ready to address complex, interwoven challenges that require not only an engineering perspective, but also the perspective of so many dis different disciplines coming together. And I hope if you're not going to the football game tomorrow that you come to the School of Engineering Forum where we'll talk about some of the impactful research that we're doing. We have professors Kurt Pennell and Linda Abriola who will talk about their impressive research in designing our understanding and improving uh, how we tackle forever chemicals, one of the really biggest challenges to our environment. The School of Engineering uh, is central to our vision of expanding research and innovative education. And one of the ways we're doing so is really thinking about partnering, partnering with the School of Medicine, partnering with the School of Public Health, partnering with our colleagues in the humanities and the arts all while thinking about how to tackle these problems. And this growth in research is actually key to our undergraduates because it allows them to get real life experience, to be in the lab, to think about hands-on learning, both in uh, their classroom, but also in the field. Brown is well known for preparing leaders determined to advance knowledge and discovery. And as we explore opportunities for research growth, we're also thinking about innovative ways that we can deliver the best learning experience 
to your students, and our, our students, your children. And finally, and perhaps the most important aspect uh, of why I wanted to take this position is the commitment that Brown has to really fostering a more diverse, inclusive, and equitable community. As a woman of color in STEM, this has been a priority for me since my days at Brown, where I lobbied, uh, and as I was telling Professor Paxton, sat in the halls, uh, in the university halls, trying to advocate for change. Well, that change has come full circle. And as dean, I witness how students are passionate about what they do and what they care about, and how together we can make this a community for everyone. So I'm both enthusiastic and inspired to be here, and I am so excited to have you spend this weekend with us. I hope you enjoy your time, and I look forward to meeting more of you this weekend. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tejo. Uh, so in case you didn't catch that, we're going to be beating Cornell both on the football field and in engineering, so you can attend those sentences. And if you're, and I just want to iterate that at Brown, undergraduate students are deeply involved in research. And right now, we have funded research opportunities available to students through the Sprint UCHA program. The deadline's Monday. Uh, Monday. And as an example, this is an opportunity that's available to first years and sophomores as well as juniors and seniors. So please encourage your students to take a look. Um, next up, it is my pleasure to welcome Jennifer Lamb. Jenny is an associate professor of Latin American and Caribbean history. She's done fascinating work on the history of mental illness in Cuba, and she is a proud graduate of the Brown University class of 2006. Please join me in welcoming Jennifer. So I have to say I half expected to hear 06 from somewhere in the back because that's my association with events that take place in this general part of campus. So um, I also want to thank the organizers and President Pax and Rashid for this opportunity to speak tonight. Um, but I also want to pull back the curtain a little bit and let you know that I was brought here under false premises. Everybody's talking in general ways about all the wonderful things that Brown is and represents, but we were in fact instructed to talk about why we love Brown. Now, as a historian and a professor, I usually tell my students to start when they encounter a question by deconstructing the assumptions that may be shaping the question. This, of course, is a leading prompt to talk about why you love Brown. Luckily, though, it's based on a pretty solid assumption. Brown students kind of love Brown. I wouldn't add an expletive, but this is a family event, so I won't. And I think that the people you see in front of you are maybe some of the best evidence for this. Brown exerts a gravitational pull on its alumni that is truly incredible to behold. I think we're the evidence that loving Brown is still something that Brown students very much do. So in responding to this leading prompt, I decided to assemble some evidence, again, in keeping with my historical disciplinary training. And I want to highlight a few qualities that I think can really help us understand both what makes Brown so great, but also, and you'll exclude, excuse the self-congratulatory tone, what makes Brown students so special, because I think the two things really go hand in hand. So I also have to confess here that I'm not just a member of the class of 06, but I am also a townie. And so I grew up just about 20 miles away from the Brown campus. And I think it's perhaps no accident that I've long thought of Brown as being kind of an approachable place. And that is one of the things that I love and I think Brown students love so much about this university. When I was an undergrad, the joke used to be that two Brown students or former Brown students could encounter each other almost anywhere in the world and find common ground to have at least an hour long, but probably several hours long conversation. And the conversation wouldn't be about Brown. It would be about all the things that they're passionate about. And I think that that reflects a student culture that's really driven by the value attached to community uh, and finding common ground. 
At the same time, I think it's important to note that Brown is also a really rigorous place. And I think it's that juxtaposition of approachability and rigor that really makes Brown so special. And our very uh, kind of accessibility and approachability, in fact, serves as the foundation to encourage students to explore, to challenge themselves, to take classes across the disciplines. In fact, at Brown, we kind of treat the undergraduate education as if it were a graduate education. Undergrads treat it as if they were grad students in terms of the importance that professors assign to their ideas and, and their kind of engagement with class and non-class material. Now, I also attended grad school somewhere else. It's a four-letter word, so I won't name it here, just down the street. And I didn't realize how special Brown was in that respect until I had the opportunity to be somewhere else and see that, in fact, all of the classes I'd taken at Brown, all the conversations I had at Brown had not only prepared me for grad school, but frankly made grad school a little disappointing. It was kind of like the day after Christmas, you know? And so I think all of that also means that Brown students are really likely to be earnest. And I know that term connotes a certain amount of naivete, and that's not how I mean it. I mean it in the most positive sense. Brown students care a lot about everything. And you probably know because you live with one, right? And I can say as a former South Brown student, I still kind of care about everything. But especially Brown students care about their education, their coursework. And this is what struck me so much when I had the opportunity to be at one of Brown's peer institutions, that at Brown, classes aren't the background against which college life transpire. They are the stuff of college. Brown students really care about class. And that means that Brown students are also really committed. They're committed to service, to justice, but to learning and community. And so as committed and excited as Brown students are about what happens within the classroom, they are equally excited about extending what they learn in the classroom beyond it. So in conclusion, I want to say that as a member of the faculty and someone who is not so distant from my own undergraduate education, but distant enough that I have had to revise all of the pop culture references in my lectures already, twice, I still love Brown. But I never love Brown more than when I have the opportunity to experience loving Brown through the eyes of my students, who come to class and come to my office brimming with insights, eager to know more, and insistent on finding, or I think better said, pursuing meaning. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you so much, Jennifer. And I'd like to share that my own personal gratitude because Jennifer is one of the faculty members who helps to make possible the ex Brown experiences away from our campus. So one of the most amazing things is that we have over 100 students right now on study abroad. And for many years, Brown has had a wonderful program, a partnership with a wonderful program in Cuba, one of the few programs in which undergraduate students, American undergraduate students, can study there. She was a student who participated on that program, and that program today continues to allow students to engage in archival research um, overseas. So. Come learn more tomorrow. Come learn more tomorrow at, at, at Jennifer's presentation. Um, <laughs> Finally, it is my pleasure to, to uh, introduce Zachary Sang. Zachary is a professor of German studies and a professor of comparative literature, also a, a, a colleague in the office of the dean of the faculty. Zachary is originally from Singapore. He's a graduate of the Brown class of 93. I think as Jennifer said, someone should shout 93 right now. <laughs> And he loved Brown so much that he continued on to get his master's degree in 1994. Uh, welcome, Zachary. Thank you very much, and very warm welcome to all of you. It's so great to see you here. So in August of 1990, I arrived at Brown as an international student, a first-generation student from Singapore a small country in Southeast Asia with, at that point, a population of 2.5 million. So much of what I was going to experience that fall was going to be brand new to me. I had never really left the Asia-Pacific region. I had never celebrated Thanksgiving. I had never seen snow. I had never tasted apple pie. 
I spent the next four years, in fact, with my eyes agog, with my ears set wide, eager to experience, absorb, learn, and process everything that Brown, New England, and the United States was throwing my way. In 1994, when I graduated from Brown, my curiosity had been quickened in all kinds of wonderful ways, and the effects of that first kindling remain with me even today. It inspired me years ago to return to graduate school and eventually to embark on a teaching career that has spanned several countries spread over three continents. And when I stand here today reflecting on that journey, that journey that took me out from this campus into the world and then back again, I'm struck by one thing. It was at Brown that I first learned how to be in the world. By that I mean that Brown has taught me and Brown continues to teach me so much about what it means to be actively in the world, not just passively situated in some place or another, in some culture or in some community. From my fellow students, from my teachers at Brown, I learned to recognize and value difference, whether it be drawn along national, cultural, linguistic, religious, or other lines. But they also always inspired me to search for ways to speak across that difference, to reach out across that divide in order to build alliances, to forge friendships. It was here at Brown that I learned the value of connecting to a local community, of participating in the pressing concerns of the here and now. But at the same time, I also learned to attune myself to different possibilities, possibilities of likeness, of solidarity on a broader, more global scale. So these are some of the ways in which Brown opened me up to the world and opened up the world for me. Brown helped me to do more than just find my place in the world. It inspired me to forge my path to make a place for myself in the world. The Greek philosopher Heraclitus once said, no one ever steps in the same river twice because it's never the same river and one is never the same person. I am not the same person I was in 1990, but neither is Brown the same Brown. It has changed because the world has changed and Brown is profoundly embedded in that world as an actor, an agent, a driver of change. It has changed because we have changed Brown, because Brown is a sum of everything that we bring to it as students, as teachers, as families, as alumni, as activists, as leaders. Over the past two years or so, the pandemic has thrown us back onto ourselves. We have retreated into the safety of our homes, the comfort of our pods, but at the same time, it has become painfully apparent to everyone that our problems are global. Their solutions cannot be found in individual actions, no matter how decisive, no matter how well-intentioned. The path forward has to be found together, collectively, through consensus, through dialogue, and above all, through mutual care. As we celebrate our return to in-person activities this year, I'm reminded to, that to be present in this community is also to participate in its ties to other places to other cultures, to other times. My years as a teacher at Brown, as an advisor at Brown, have been so rich because the students have opened up for me a world of languages and experiences, of voices and histories drawn from far beyond the confines of College Hill. So in my own mind, I sometimes replay scenes from my college days. And sometimes these scenes are so vivid, so specific, it's like they have um, a timestamp, a postmark on them. Autumn of 1991, standing outside the Ratty, that's our dining hall, marveling at the leaves all ablaze with change. December of 1993, gathering with friends outside the CIT, that's our computing center over there, as the snow came down in pillowy waves. These spots of time, as the poet William Wordsworth once called them, they transcend the specifics of their embeddedness. At various times in my life, in different places, in different circumstances, I have called upon them, used them to reflect on the ineffable sum of everything that Brown has taught me. Among its many gifts to me, there is none that I treasure more than this, the courage, the humility, to be so profoundly, so resolutely in the world. Thank you.
Thank you, Zachary, so much. Um, for those of us who have known Brown over the decades, I will share with you that it is just amazing every year to welcome your students to our campus and to see this community grow. And among the greatest joys right now as an instructor is seeing the tremendous growth of international students, of first generation college students here on our campus, and also the way that the university has opened up to welcome in scholars from Afghanistan, scholars from Ukraine, who are dealing with the global conflicts that are of our age. So I wanna end by thanking all of the wonderful alumni, faculty, colleagues who are here, Tejal, Jennifer, Zachary, inviting you to attend their faculty forums this weekend. Um, and I invite everyone to join us for a reception in the back of the tent. Uh, thank you so much for coming. Thank you for letting your students come and hope to get a chance to speak with you. Thank you.